Welcome everyone to our seventh and final event in Contact's Produce Safety Webinar Series. We've successfully completed season one. This series, of course, tackles a fresh produce food safety topic every month through a dynamic webinar series that will bring together industry, academia, and regulatory minds to solve some of the produce industry's biggest and most timely challenges. This series is part of a larger industry outreach and risk mitigation project called CONTACT, or Scientific Challenges and Cost-Effective Management of Risks Associated with Implementation of Produce Safety Regulations. This project is supported by the Specialty Crops Research Initiative from the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the view of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This webinar series, coupled with other research and extension activities, is part of a collaborative effort across 10 different universities or government institutions to enhance produce safety knowledge and compliance across the industry. We are so grateful to our collaborators for their efforts and support in this webinar series. Their logos can be seen on the screen. This multi-year webinar series will be back again in September of 2022, and we'll plan to address a brand new series um, of content chosen by you, covering topics on risk-based thinking and FDA's Ag Water tool, sanitation case studies, data sharing, root cause analysis, sanitizer use, and more. There are still some open slots for next season, so if there are topics you wish to hear more about, please let us know. You can email, use our social media, provide feedback on surveys, or even text me. And we promise season two will not disappoint. While this webinar series lets us meet with you once a month, that's just not enough for us. We'd love to hashtag make contact with you about today's webinar or other produce safety news and research on our Twitter and Instagram pages. Follow us on these platforms at PS underscore Psy. Let's welcome our speaker today, Dr. Bob Whitaker. In 2020, Dr. Bob founded Whitaker Consulting to develop educational material and provide produce safety and technology consulting services to the fresh fruit and vegetable industries. From 2008 to early 2020, Bob served the Produce Marketing Association as its chief science and technology officer, responsible for produce safety, technology, supply chain management, government affairs, and sustainability. Bob also served on the Center for Produce Safety Board of Directors and Executive Committee from its founding in 2007 until June 2020, and was the first chair of the CPS Technical Committee. Bob's career is legendary and a priceless resource to our produce industry. Bob is joined by a fantastic panel who will assist Bob in today's webinar. Here's a little bit about each panelist. Ed Tracy has over 38 years of senior management experience in logistics and supply chain management, working with major Canadian retail chains, including Loblaw Companies, Shoppers, Drug Mart, and Sobeys, as Senior Vice President of Logistics and Engineering. For the past 12 years, Tracy monitors and forecasts trends, designs, related products, services, and educational events related to sustainability and the fresh produce and floral supply chains for the International Fresh Produce Association members. Rob Scharf is a professor and econ an economist at The Ohio State University who has spent over two decades examining the economics of foodborne illness in academia and the government with FDA. His research is focused on economic burden of illness, intervention evaluation, and consumer and industry response to food safety events. Laurel Dunn is an assistant professor and food safety extension specialist at the University of Georgia. Laurel's research and extension focuses on the microbial safety of fresh fruit and vegetables on farms and in packing houses, as well as through the supply chain all the way to the distribution center. Steve Strube joined Wegmans in November of 1996 after nine years of dairy farming. He now has been with Wegmans for 25 years and has enjoyed many different opportunities in his career, including produce manager, produce inspector, produce zone merchandiser, including management of their local grown program, as well as managing the startup of two entities unique to Wegmans, 
both the Wegmans Organic Farm and Wegmans Cheese Caves. In 2016, he was given the opportunity to become manager of produce food safety and continues to hold that position today. Clearly a fabulous and talented panel. So welcome, Bob. The floor is all your. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the produce supply web and produce safety and provide you a kind of a, a brief overview of the current state of fresh produce safety. I'm going to build upon the presentations you've already had. There's six that have come before it. We're not going to go a lot of those topics, but they will come up as we go along our, our presentation and discussion today. We're going to do it as an integrated piece. And so I'm going to make the master presentation, but along the way, the four panelists are going to jump in and present in their areas of expertise. We might as well leverage them when we got them on the phone just for more than just uh, answering questions. Talk a little bit about our ongoing challenge and some of the impacts of the recalls we've seen and outbreaks and alerts and what's at the bottom of that and what, what the challenges remain there. We'll talk a little bit about the structure of this supply chain, how we got there and what some of the challenges are and opportunities that we have given the supply chains that we have and the ever-evolving nature that they represent. We'll touch a little bit on food safety culture, certainly a topic that's come back to the forefront of everybody's discussions nowadays, what with FDA emphasizing that with their smarter way of doing food safety regulation. And we'll talk a little bit about what the opportunities are as we move forward. When you think about the produce industry and produce safety, it's an interesting thing. Cause when I think about produce, I think about the pride the industry has in itself for being fast and for being nimble and being creative and innovative. But really, when you think about the industry, it's not an industry. It is a collection of industries. A grower that, that grows fresh produce in California is going to be markedly different than one that's perhaps in Florida. And the one in New York state will be even more different than the one that might be in Mexico or in Chile. They'll have different parts of their operations. They have different dynamics, different pressures, different strengths and weaknesses than everybody else. But there's also other parts. There's trucking and transportation of all sorts and types that are in there. There's a number of vendors that sell different products into the industry. There's, of course, the outlets where the points of convergence with consumers take place at, at retail stores and big box stores and restaurants, those types of places. So it's really a collection of all those types of industries that, that makes, it, makes it fairly challenging when you look at it. Produce to me sometimes, and food safety is sometimes like changing the direction of a ship in the ocean. It's there, but there's also icebergs in the way. And changes have proven to be very difficult over the last 25 years. I think about things that I especially went through this when I was looking to retire. I started to look at where we started with all the discussions on food safety. And then you look at where we are today and some of the events I've listened in on this year or attended. And we're really talking about the same subject matters, aren't we? Even the list of subjects that have been, com that have been covered in this webinar series that Laura has are really the same ones we were talking about 20 years ago. Think about water quality and its use, adjacent land use, hazard analysis, risk assessment, traceability, EMP, sanitation. They're all still there. And oftentimes we're still making the same comments that we were making 25 years ago. There's been a lot of talk and there's been some improvement, but it just doesn't seem like we're able to push the ball across in a lot of cases. If I look at the industry and I try to think about a visual for how I would rate where we are, and again, this would be my perceptions on this based on my experiences and time I've spent in the industry, we really have three categories as I see it. We have the, all the way on the left-hand side of your screen, there's a group of people out there that just haven't gotten the memo yet, that they really reluctant to change. They'll cover a seasonal audit if they have to, very limited training, maybe show up at a local grower training conference every couple of years, something of that nature. And they'll clean their facilities and their pack houses and their equipment you know, once a year, whether it needs it or not. That's where that group is. And then there's the vast majority, I think, of the industry where really compliance is the goal. They can pass a customer or regulatory kind of baseline audit, and that's great. I can teach my golden retriever to pass an audit. We know the questions, we know the answers. Really, it's become a science on how to do that. And I've been reminded of that since I do a little consulting now again with some clients that really cleaned up pretty good on the day of an audit. 
But when you show up, when they're not expecting you to show up, it's a bit of a different story. They have microbial testing programs and they do what they have to do, whether they're actually swabbing the right areas. I'm not so sure sometimes. They have good cleaning and sanitation every day, but is it really the right way? Or is it just something they've got a certain amount of time for? And if things get rushed, are they really going to stop everything at the sacrifice of making orders and still get things clean? Employee training is something you do in tailgates maybe or at the beginning of a season, but that's about it. And traceability, yeah, pretty good, but mostly paper-based. On the other hand, on the upper side, you have the people that really protect the company. And these are the people that are proactive. They're engaged. These companies are, I think are becoming more and more, but they really take into account compliance more than they not protection as opposed to compliance. And they very much focus on education and innovation. I think what's happening though, is as we go on, we are seeing this, well, the peak of the curve moving more towards the right. There are more people now that are understanding what has to take place. And for a lot of reasons that we'll raise as we discuss today. I think this peak of the curve is moving more towards a protection view and doing what needs to be done to make sure the food is safe as opposed to just being a compliance mentality. And it's not all bad. There's certainly been a lot of improvements and I don't mean to sound like I'm dumping on the industry because that's not my intent. My intent is to make comments so that we can get better. And what we've seen over the time is that we've created great, greater awareness about food safety. I mean, that midpoint is moving. I was at a conference last week where a leader in the industry said that a CEO that is in charge of one of the larger companies, the industry said that you know, it's been a journey for him, not being a scientist on trying to understand what needs to be done and why it needs to be done and why it's important it takes time. So it gives me hope that the effort to make awareness, to have seminar series is like this, to do some of the other things we see in the industry is making an impact on people that are the decision makers in the industry. And so we'll keep moving forward. Certainly we can argue that the knowledge base has grown exponentially. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as the day goes on. The detection tools have certainly improved and this is important. We need to know where these organisms are and when to expect them so that we can manage them. And I think that's something that we didn't always have a decade ago, a positive test that would show up on an operator I was, was always questioning whether it was actually accurate. We saw lots of instances, and I lived through some when I was actually in the industry managing a company where false positives came through and false negatives came through that ended up causing us a, a great deal of heartburn as we tried to work through those issues as they began to evolve. Technology is beginning to provide different opportunities in food safety. It always has. I think it's accelerating a little bit, and I think that's important as we look to our future. Certainly there's more expansive training and education opportunities now. Just about every day, there is some type of training or educational opportunity in food safety for this industry around the country somewhere. And I, one thing I'm really pleased to see is this influx of talent. Every place I go or people I talk to, or even some of these kind of virtual events that we have, I'm amazed to look at some of the names and see the new people that are there. People that weren't always there. When I was at PMA, sometimes. I would look out in the audience and it was like I was preaching to the choir. The same person heard me talk two months ago someplace or three months ago and last year and so on. Today, when I go someplace, I was actually speaking at an event last week. You look out and I hardly recognized anybody. I've only been retired two years. So it tells you there's a lot of new people coming to the industry, both in the industry itself, on the growing side, on the buying side, as well as the research side. We're seeing new people all the time. And I think that can only bode well for the industry. But I think we still face a lot of challenges and the complexity of the supply chain, our main kind of focus point today is one of those challenges that we have. We seem to be preoccupied with one size fits all approaches and they just don't work. The approach of the industry all along has been to get groups of people together and decide on a guidance or something of that nature or a solution that everybody would use. And yet these operations are just not the same. In fact, you can take two operations side by side growing spinach in the Salinas Valley. And I guarantee you, they will have different risk profiles. They will have used different vendors for some of their inputs. They will cultivate their land differently. They may have different water sources. They'll have different people, different harvest machines and on. They'll have even sometimes different adjacent people based on where their land are, adjacent land uses. So how do you take a one size fit all approach and make that work? You can't just check the box. You have to engage and you have to be involved. Operations are very varied. 
And the partners along the supply chain are also important. And one thing that I think has really been important in the last few years, and we'll touch on it today again, is that all of the focus initially was just on the farm. But as we've learned as time has gone forward, that this really is indeed a shared responsibility across the entire supply chain. Each area and every mode of production shares different risks. They have risks that are unique. They have some that are the same, and they need to be managed properly at that place in the supply chain in order to ensure the safety or maintain the safety of the food. Companies clearly need to engage in the science. And this has not been something that is uh, that has been common. Yes, you do see people showing up at events and, and things of that nature. I see them at the CPS symposiums and other types of like uh, programs. They're there. But how much of that work, how much of that knowledge and that information is actually getting integrated into the company's food safety program? And that's really important. Sometimes we, I hear a lot of, yeah, that work was done on spring mix and I'm growing spinach here, so they can't possibly be the same. Or I grow tomatoes, or that work was done on cantaloupe. And so I, and it wasn't done in my region. I'm in Florida and they're in Georgia, or I'm in Georgia and they're in the Baja in Mexico. Instead of looking at the similarities, instead of looking at where things do converge, we find reasons. We let perfect be the enemy of good. And so we, we convince ourselves that it's important to wait until it's been done on our crop, on our ground. And so we pull back and we don't do anything aggressively or proactively to answer the questions we might have, vet that research, even conduct or ask or volunteer to be part of a research program that would give us greater insights. And so we let perfect be the enemy of good much too often. Sometimes we sit back and we expect FDA to solve our issues. We're going to wait until FDA makes a final ruling on this, that, or the other rule. But why would we expect FDA to be able to solve our problems? We know our farms, we know our production facilities, we know our stores and our restaurants better than anybody. So why can't we assess the risks that we're having and then look to develop and look to the science to develop control points that we can use to manage the safety of the products we produce. And we can't expect F and we can't expect FDA to weigh in as a full partner unless we provide transparency to the supply web. And we'll talk today about our historical inability to do that, provide them traceability information so they can actually protect public health in a timely fashion. It's kind of an endless circle we go through. We get mad at FDA because it takes them so long to, to find what the cause of an outbreak is. And yet we don't have the documentation in place and the ability to share that with them uh, on a timely basis, on a consistent basis, so that we can solve these public safety alerts in a quick way. And lastly, the industry needs, I think, as the last challenge is really, it needs to look at its culture. And I'll talk more about that as we go on, but it's the shift from being compliant and passing an audit or meeting the rules and regulations versus really being proactive and using risk and science-based food safety programs to manage the food safety of our products along the supply web. I think in a lot of ways, from what you've heard me say so far, you can see that I think produce safety is at a crossroads. We can keep doing what we've been doing or recognize the need to change. And I often rely on this quote from Darwin, that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. So when we think of sustainability of the produce industry, and we think of improving produce safety, it's this ability to recognize that our industry has changed. The way we grow products, deliver products to the marketplace, use those products, has changed over time. Our knowledge base has changed. And so therefore, our, the way we produce and the way we think about produce safety has to change as well. Otherwise, we face ourselves with a, a number of outbreaks and things that interrupt the industry and cause damage to consumers, and they become quite private, quite public. Just for the heck of it, I went back and Rob's going to talk in a few minutes about outbreaks, but I went back and I looked at the national outbreak reporting system and it's, I think it's far from perfect. It's some place to go in and look and get yourself checkpoints if you want, or guide rails to look at illnesses. Uh, there's a lot of duplications and confusion over different types of products and how they're described. But if you just look at the years 2000, 2018, which were the limits of the data that was available there. I just picked 24 fresh produce items. 
yeah, for some of it, it's a little biased because I picked the ones that I'm familiar with that have had problems. But if you look at that, there are 485 different illness outbreaks that have been tracked by the CDC off of those items in that 18 years, okay? 20,000 illnesses were reported. Every time I see the number of illnesses reported, I always multiply. In talking with CDC and working with CDC over the years, they figure about one in every 30, 31 victims of a foodborne illness actually is sick enough or takes the time to report that illness and get medical help. And it, I multiply those by 30 when I look at some of these outbreaks sometimes is a more likely target. There's been 70 deaths during that period of time. And you have to remember in all those numbers, 2018 to today, 2020, 2022, weren't exactly incident-free. We've seen a number of high-profile illness outbreaks with a number of different consumers affected. And so that kind of gives you the scope of what we're looking at. Certainly the detection tools are more aggressively deployed than prevention strategies. We can detect things almost every place we look. If we do the proper swabbing, we use the right tools. And yet sometimes prevention strategies are still not quite what we'd like them to be. And certainly repeated incidents in any one category of product means increased surveillance. And so that product now becomes a higher risk. I hear people talk about higher risk products. And I think to myself, no, it's really a higher risk practices that may be employed across a number of different products. So I think we get off track there sometimes because we're looking at them, we're going to find it. And in fact, in most of the research that I've seen that has been done, every time we look for it in a product and a production environment, packing environment, even up the supply chain, as we'll talk later today, we can find indicators of pathogens. We can find surrogates and indeed we can find the pathogens. And fresh produce as a result of all of this has become famous for the wrong reasons. We end up a lot of times in late night television or in the uh, editorial sections of newspapers with cartoons like the one you see on the left side. And so the impact of the industry has been severe. And I, and so we want to talk a little bit about what these outbreaks mean and what is actually the cost and what that impact is. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Rob Scharf from Ohio State, and he can go through his set of presentation slides. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so I agree with everything you've said there. I think that one of the things that you mentioned was that there is this movement from compliance, the, the, a compliance norm more towards protecting the company. And I think that really fits in well with what I'm going to say here, which is when we think about what is the impact on the industry on the left here. This is a chart that was put together by the Economic Research Service of the USDA a few years ago. And you may say, well, why am I not just focusing on food industry costs? Those costs are important. And that's really ultimately what industry cares about. But that being said, household costs and public health sector expenditures are also really critical because those are the inputs into the food industry costs. We need to understand what's happening at the household level, the public health sector level, to understand how those costs, how, what are the costs going to be in the food industry sector? Uh, next slide. And so you know, what I've done is I also have given a list of information here about number of outbreaks, illnesses, and then also the costs associated with the foodborne illness. And these are really all more on the household side, right? So it's not really, we're not quite at industry costs yet, but what we're looking at here is, and again, I'm using a little bit more dated information because I'm relying on already published studies. And the good news is that we're currently working on updating all of these numbers and we should have some new numbers out by the end of the summer. But where are we right now? So basically based on the uh, Peter at all 2013 paper that looks at uh, attribution to different types of attribution of outbreaks across different types of foods. We find that there are actually 1,593 produce related outbreaks that are associated with pathogens. And uh, so this is a much larger number than what about them, but it, it's larger probably for couple of reasons, probably it's more complete, but it also includes the, their estimation of what the risk was based on inclusion of complex foods. 
And so they had an algorithm that they used to determine whether, how do you determine what portion of an output, what is the likelihood that a particular outbreak is going to be related to produce or something else. And so they came up with this number 1,593 for produce. And again, that's a number that is likely to change as we get better at, at doing these types of analyses. And there is a large amount of uncertainty associated with it, but this does amount to about 35% of all outbreaks. So produce is associated with a large number of a large portion of the outbreaks that we see in our society. It's actually also associated with a larger, a large number of illnesses based on the Pater study combined with the Scallon study that looked at the total burden, total number of illnesses throughout society. Combining those two, you get 4.4 million illnesses and uh, 313 deaths, which is 46% of the illnesses nationwide and 23% of the deaths. So again, very substantial amount of the foodborne illness that we see has some relation to produce. Combining that with cost of illness estimates that I produced, you end up with a cost of 5.9 billion, which is 29% of the costs of illness from those uh, illnesses that have been, that are associated with particular pathogens. So this is really important because this information should be alarming to people in the industry because this feeds into the likelihood that you are going to be involved in an outbreak or a recall or something else. As people be have become more aware of these outbreaks, as the number of outbreaks associated with produce have risen, there has been, as Bob mentioned, there's been more looking for it. And so you're finding it more. There's also been technology improvements in, in terms of the surveillance detection and traceability. And so the, all of those things are much easier than they used to be, which puts, makes it more likely that a company today is going to be associated with one of these outbreaks or a recall associated with it. And so I think that's important. So next, so what are the cost to industry? Again, this is something that we're working on currently right now, and we don't have solid numbers, but we can categorize the costs. There are compliance costs associated with regulatory action, of course, and some in, as Bob mentioned, some in the industry only do what they need to do for compliance. But there are also costs that maybe go by beyond that to the extent that industry invests in technologies that go beyond the regulatory minimums. Now, one reason that companies might do that is because recalls and outbreaks are really expensive. So with recalls, you have costs associated with product removal and destruction. Facilities need to be closed down oftentimes for cleaning and for to make sure that the processes are in place to, to end the, the problem with the food. You also have lost sales and production. And then finally, reputation and crisis management costs. And really, when we talk about costs, one of the things that tends to be one of the larger costs associated with both recalls and outbreaks, actually probably more so with outbreaks, are those reputation costs. They, they tend to be the biggest cost when you do have an outbreak where people actually get sick. But it also is an effect, does have an effect when there's a recall as well. So again, with outbreaks, the, all of the associated recall related costs are also important there, but there's some other costs that also could occur. So you could have spillover effects from competitor outbreaks. So if you look back at the spinach outbreak in 2006, it didn't just affect the farm that was producing tainted spinach. It also affected leafy greens as a whole there. It was not just even spinach. There have been studies done showing that the consumption of leafy greens declined substantially. More recently, we've had the same thing happen with romaine lettuce, right? So the romaine outbreaks of more recent years, we've seen the exact same thing. This is, these spillover effects are really huge. And this is the reason why the industry as a whole needs to be acting to try to encourage their members to go above and beyond what is the, the regulatory minimum. In part because of as Bob mentioned, the regulatory minimum is often set up in such a way that it's one size fits all. And again, that may work for some companies, but for other companies, it's not really going to have the positive effect that's, that, that it's meant to have. So you might have to do something beyond that. Let's see. 
And there's also litigation costs. Bill Marler is obviously the famous food safety lawyer. And he said that generally speaking, the cost can be large, but there's really companies almost always trying to settle out of court because of the potential reputation costs with ongoing lawsuits. So that's a significant cost. But again, probably the biggest cost associated with outbreaks is the added reputation and crisis management costs. So the reputation costs for dealing with outbreaks can be huge. You can lose customers so easily. You can lose a, a large customer base. And there have been studies done looking at some of the larger outbreaks, looking at how they've affected firms, publicly traded firms and their valuation. And they've found that there have been pretty, pretty large effects on stock prices and therefore firm valuation from these, so from some of these outbreaks. So again, as we're able to detect more of these outbreaks, we're able to detect more pathogens in foods, the outbreak and recall costs are going to go up, which is going to create more of an incentive for firms to go beyond just compliance and to move into that protect the company mindset. Next slide. I also, I wanted to close by just talking about a few other supply chain is, issues for produce. One thing that we've seen with COVID is that there have been having supply chain issues generally that affect issues that affect the, the supply chain more generally, you do see disruptions that have had a, a specific effect on the food industry. And I would say that this also at least might have an effect on food safety as well. Although one of the things that happened during 2020 is if you look at the number of outbreaks, they fell dramatically, but that's not because all of a sudden we got a lot safer. It's because public health professionals who were looking at looking for illnesses and outbreaks associated with food had to redirect their efforts towards COVID. And I think actually, if there was a, a fair county, I would guess based on sort of economic behavior that you would probably have seen an increase in number of food safety problems, because when you have supply chain disruption, you have perishable products that are sitting for longer periods of time where pathogens can grow, where there could be spoilage of the product. And so that's a potential problem. There was also a shortage of inputs, cleaning supplies. Do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you go into the grocery store and look for personal cleaning supplies. You can find them on the shelves. I think to a lesser extent that happened with industry as well. And then finally, what we've learned from all that is there's a need for resilience, that firms have to become more resilient to deal with these problems. This uh, the, you know, just in time model works pretty well when times are going well, but there's there, as we saw, sometimes times there, there are these disruptions and they do happen more often than you might think. They're not always as global as something like COVID or even the Ukraine war, but they, uh, but they do have impacts on public health as well. And firms need to be ready for that. With regard to, I've already talked a little bit about COVID, but I also want to mention a little bit about the Ukraine war. And I think that nobody's, I shouldn't say nobody, there hasn't been as much attention paid to the effect, the potential effect on supply chains from the Ukraine war as there was to COVID in part because we haven't seen a whole lot of it yet, but I think this is going to be an event that might even eclipse COVID in terms of its effect on the, on supply chains. Now, COVID was unique because you had large amounts of food that were not only disrupt the transportation was disrupted, but they were also, there was a, this switch, this move from supplying food to restaurants, to, to moving a lot of that product over to grocery stores and. So that was a unique aspect of that. But with the Ukraine war, we're going to have other problems because of shortages of fuel, fertilizers, and grains. And those are going to all really disrupt the, the supply chain for all foods, not just grains. And we're already seeing that. So for example, just recently, they, they've been talking a lot about how we were having a diesel shortage, right? And the East coast of the United States has a diesel shortage. The fuel just, the supplies are just at, at bare bones levels. And what happens if you have a truck full of tomatoes, right? And you don't, you get to the truck stop and they have no gas. Just sits there and bad things happen. 
when produce sits for too long. So there could be some problems there just looking out to the future. But generally speaking, I think that this is an area where industry really needs to be forward-looking and needs to look out for the potential problems that, that we're going to have with these crises and also with just general food safety issues related to produce. And that's all I had to say. Thanks, Rob. And you gave us certainly a lot to think about and a lot of depth of knowledge on what some of the economic and even operational impacts of some of these outbreaks have been. You've mentioned the, the impacts on consumers. I think it's important to recognize that the consumption of produce is actually trending down. I've heard it suggested that because of all of our problems, we're driving people to other use of other types of foods, and that's not where we want them to go. From a public health and nutrition point of view, we want them to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. And the consequences for the industry, I think you've touched on, commodities get set back for years. I worked at a spinach producing company during the 2006 outbreak that you mentioned, Rob, and I can tell you that it took several years for the volumes to come back. And we've seen that repeated time and time again with different commodities at a 2018 Romaine outbreak it was reportedly cost the industry $80 million, but there's also the human cost as well that Rob pointed out. And I think that is even more significant and more worrisome, but also the individual companies, there's companies that just disappear because of their food safety issues. And we've seen companies that not only get set back because their commodity has been affected. One of the things that happens when a company has problems is some of your most promising and best performing employees move on to another company because they know you're in for a hard time for the next few years, that the customers aren't going to come running back and you're going to have issues across the board in terms of producing product and getting the best land bases and things of that nature. So employees tend to lose some of their best performers and it shines a light on a food segment, one of them being traceability. And it's complicated by this supply web that has multiple suppliers for the same commodities, different production sites based on seasons any different production regions, different product labels. One producer might produce three or four different labels uh, of products that makes this whole idea of traceability sometimes difficult. And in different points of supplier convergence and consumer contact. And so how did we get there? And I'm not going to go through this just for time's sake. I did this more as an exercise just out of interest when I was putting together some thoughts for this, this event today. You can find a lot of this information. It's online. You can find it. And I've linked it back roughly to different times. I may be off a little bit here and there. There were some wonderful articles in the Packer a few years back that actually detail this from some of the folks who were around during some of the early informative stages of the produce industry. But remember, produce started off as a local situation. A farmer grew product and he brought it to the town he was near and it got sold. It was a pretty easy, it was a pretty easy supply line. That line got more and more complicated as people migrated into the cities. As uh, the Western expansion happened, all of these different things took place so that there was a consolidation of production regions, so California and Arizona and Texas and Florida. And you saw that the production could be done there. It could be done on a larger scale. And therefore it, you, you had the beginnings of what became a supply chain of shipping this product from where it could be easily produced because of the cost of land and the cost of water and the climate to more densely populated urban and suburban areas. And then you saw the different technologies that enabled that in terms of new containers and packaging, refrigerated trucks, vacuum cooling, all of these types of things began to take place as we began to merge into and find that we wanted these products year round. When I grew up, we saw a lot of products out of a can during most of the winter in upstate New York, because it just wasn't around. Fresh produce was something that we got in June and July and August. And by September, it was pretty much gone. And then you were into to canned goods. And later on, it was a big deal to get them in frozen. Uh, but today we want them fresh. We want them in the grocery stores year round and we want them to be of high quality. And so that caused moving and shifting of different areas where this could be produced based on climate. And so we really started to become more of a global industry. And now in recent years, we've seen different types and modes of production from covered ag situations and the number of different ways that is done. And we've seen that take place. We've seen outbreaks because we get very complex because our foods are often used as ingredients. They're not just used as a fresh vegetable that you would consume, but they're blended up into salads, they're blended up into wet salads, or they might be used in soups, things of that nature. And so when you see a recall, often now you see it in waves, the commodities recalled, and then everything that commodity was used in. 
gets recalled. And that was uh, the first time I saw that really was in peanuts, right? Where peanut, turns out peanut and peanut powder and peanut oil and all these things really caused huge complex outbreaks that went on for a long time. We've seen that now with onions and several other types of products in more recent times. We've seen different ways of delivering products. And so we have a supply chain that is evolving and evolving to this truly global industry. And for that, I think we'll rely on Ed Tracy to shed some light on some of his thoughts on this area. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And next slide, you can just roll those down. When talking about traceability and some people have approached me and say, why don't you do it? It's, you know, what's so hard about it? Let me tell you, I'm an engineer. I like to speak from facts and figures in our industry in the U S to do traceability. We have to trace billion cases of produce being delivered to 575,000 restaurants and food service facilities, over 70,000 grocery stores, and 154,000 convenience and dollar type stores because everyone's selling produce now. And click the next slide there. And all those 6 billion cases take at least 2.4 million truckloads and click the next one. And I like to imagine things. And so if you put those 2.4 million trucks nose to tail, they would circle the earth at the equator. That's how much product and how many truckloads of product we'd have to, and we do have to figure out how to trace accurately and be able to provide information quickly. Next slide. And in, on top of that, we have a very complex supply chain. It's not linear. Certain products are. I think manufactured foods, soups and cereals, they're easy. They get inputs from multiple farmers and they process it in a factory and it's very controlled environment and they ship it and their supply chain is fairly linear. Ours is not. We do all sorts of different things to our produce and looking in the middle area, repacking or regrading, cutting it and processing it, or we store. It. And then we have multiple channels we send it to, and then and various retailers from online and traditional stores and food service where we serve it as meals and subscription services like a meal in a box. And then somehow miraculously it gets to the consumer. And if we're very lucky, we don't poison them because we've screwed up or not handled the product all the way through that supply chain properly. Uh, and next slide. And one more complexity is we don't do it just within the borders of our country. That is a global industry. And like Bob, when I was young, we never got fresh strawberries in the winter. We bought those, our strawberries from the frozen food aisle. And now we get every, just about every product year round. And we figured out how to ship it from the Southern hemisphere when the Northern hemisphere's not in production and vice versa. So it is a very complex challenge in order to implement proper traceability. Next slide. And fortunately, the industry after the often mentioned 2006 spinach crisis, industry got together and they said, what we got is not good enough. We need to get better. And we 
got together late or somewhere around 2009 or started talking in 2008 and uh, started getting uh, to work. 08, 09, and we developed a industry standard case identification uh, system or case labeling with standardized data that is to be shared. And the idea was if we can, one can keep and store the records in the same format and with the same definitions, if we're involved in a recall or a trace back investigation, we can provide, we're all speaking the same language. We all can track the product in and out of our facilities and be able to go through that supply chain very quickly. We did test actually as part of FISMA 204 and some of the scenarios we put together were PTI compliant companies and we were able to do trace back and forward and with tomatoes, which just about hit every box on that supply chain diagram. And we were able to do end to end trace back investigations within 24 hours. Good news is today, around 65% of those 6 billion cases are labeled with this label. As well, through a lot of hard work and a lot of meetings and education of FDA, as they were writing the FISMA 204 traceability rule during the eight years it took them to write it, we are very pleased that all the elements of PTI are incorporated into their proposed rule, and we're confident they'll be in the final rule. They have, I don't want to bash FDA, but they took it upon themselves in order to try to solve other limitations of their authority, if you will. And they added a few elements that we pointed out to them don't really enhance a traceability or will not make it quicker to find the source and where all like product has gone. And we're really hoping those elements that are over and above PTI exit the final rule when we see it in November. And we worked very hard as an industry to come up with a program and communicate to the rule makers of what we're doing. And we actually are very pleased that 90% of FISMA is lifted right from what we created in PTI. We even taught them a language call with critical tracking events and key data elements. That's PTI speak. It's in my 204. And the other uh, note on getting that number from 65% up, we are expecting once the rule is finalized, that number to quickly bounce to from 65% to 90%. And that's based on conversations with the major buyers who are waiting to see the final rule and they're figuring out how their company will be able to comply before making it a requirement of their suppliers. There's a handful of retailers who have made it a requirement of doing business. That's how we got to 65%. And when the other majors finally draw that line on the sand after they see the final rule, we'll get plus 90%. I won't be happy until we get 100%, but at least there's a pathway forward. And I believe we're going to get there eventually.
I think that's the last slide. That's it. Thank you, Ed. And again, I, people, it's important that are listening to understand that when Ed says that 90% of, of the rule has got language and reflects the intentions of PTI, that's been about a 13 or 14 year journey that people like Ed have been on and leading the industry in over time. Certainly anything that gets us closer is really important because I, I look at traceability sometimes as a re reflectance of the industry's inability or reluctance to change. But we can track, you can order something today online and it'll tell you each time it leaves a depot right up to the time it arrives on your porch, but we can't seem to get ourselves together to track produce. And the result has been failures within some of these outbreaks to really identify what's going on in a timely fashion. Or sometimes a failure just not to recognize it at all because we didn't get there in time to actually see the actual conditions under which the crop was grown, harvested, or shipped. And as the supply chain has grown to this web, that only makes it more difficult and really calls to mind what we need to do in terms of being able to track product so that we can enhance our ability to protect public health. I think it's also a reflection of culture. The produce safety culture has been bouncing around the industry as a terminology for a number of years. It's gotten heightened awareness in the last year or so because of FDA's focus on it. And there's a lot of different definitions. There's a lot been written about this. There's a lot of effort within the industry on how to measure produce safety culture. I put a description on the top of the page, read together based on some writings from Frank Giannis, who actually wrote a book on this back in 2003. Produce safety culture is the combination of individual and group behavioral patterns, values, attitudes, and competencies that drive corporate responsibility and commitment to fresh fruit and vegetable safety. So it, it highlights a couple of terms, behavioral responsibility, commitment. These are things that sometimes are a little harder to measure, sometimes a little harder to get your hands around. Every company has a food safety culture. The question is, is whether it is a proactive culture or one that just accepts what they're doing and goes for compliance. Is it risk-based or is it simply checklist mentality types of things? And I think based on the earlier discussions we've had, we're in a, certainly in a process of transition. It's a program of managed behavior. It's a behavioral change. It's a mindset. It's a set of habits that permeate the company. Can't be a checklist. And that's what we want a lot of times. Just tell me what to do. And culture doesn't work like that. It works fine if you're just going to do audits and you're just going to take samples here and when they tell you to do and get the water test done when the, on this particular date. That's okay. But it's not permeating and it's not a habit that takes place every day. It's a corporate commitment. And that makes it harder. It means it's got to start at the top of the organization, the CEO and senior management. And they can't only talk about it. They got to act it. We've all got stories in our industry where we go out on a tour and the senior management aren't even gowned up like the rest of the worker or are out there chewing gum or have jewelry on or things like that. They got to be serious about what they're doing and be serious about it when decisions are tough. When you've got to turn down a load and can't make an order, that's when the CEO needs to step in and say, yep, that's what we need to do. And that's the hard decision. And believe me, the employees are watching for that. Every corporate, every company has this culture. You get the pictures or things that I've shot. And I can't believe that if you've really got a food safety culture that's running your business throughout the industry, that I'd be able to shoot pictures of some of these scenes right next to crops that are being grown for harvest and distribution. Food safety cultures use food safety data to help companies prioritize human and financial resources. And it has to be critical, non-negotiable factors for driving business. When you have those tough decisions to make, Having the right culture, everybody lined up in the same place, everybody marching to the same order is what'll make that decision much easier. Frank, Deputy Commissioner of Foods at FDA right now, wrote a second book in 2015, Produce Safety Equals Behavior. And I put him in the same line as Aristotle. So if anybody sees Frank, they can tell him I've done that. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence that is not an act, but it's a habit. And so this is really talking about behavior management, behavior modification, training, education, and getting an entire company. We always say in the industry, but say it for 25 years, food safety is everybody's responsibility. And yet that's not the reality. 
Food safety often in many companies is the responsibility of the person in charge of food safety and spends most of his time fighting everybody else to get what needs to be done completed so that the product is as safe as possible. It really has to be about the habits and it has to be shared commitment for the production of food. Sometimes I wonder that if we looked at food safety today and what we've learned over time, could we reimagine it? Would we approach things a little differently? Most meetings I've been in over the years on food safety, when people are getting together in the industry, what they're really trying to do is justify the practices they have right now so they don't have to change it and tell everybody why that's the best way to do it and why it's safe. But would we be more open to change? Would we adopt proactive science-based cultures and embrace the science and technology that we can use to help us drive some of these decisions? And would we recruit more STEM-educated employees to the industry and be able to retain them? These are challenges that are really important to our industry as we go forward. We don't seem to be very open sometimes to embracing the science, especially as we develop and look at how we develop risk and science-based strategies. And I think of any type of proactive culture must be dependent on the behavior of engaging in the science, being involved. Professional food safety is clearly about communicating about the management of the biological systems. Where do the pathogens come from? How do they get on the produce? And what we can do to control that? And these are three simple questions that go right back to the beginnings of the industry's discussions on produce safety 20, 25 years ago. And yet today, we still don't have our arms fully around that throughout various companies and operations across the supply chain. And science can guide us to answer these questions. And yet, Scientists have trouble, they're certainly heard, but they're very often not understood. And they're two very different things. You can go to a lot of different conferences where other scientists are the audience, but if they're not the people that are actually in charge of engaging these things and making the decisions to change resource priorities and to hire different people or build different pieces of equipment or to just change the structure of the organization to meet the challenges of food safety, then chances are it's not going to get done. So we need to be able to engage across the board, across the supply chain, be able to help industry understand the good from the bad, interpret meanings, how to apply it, how to measure and refine the performance of those changes as we go along. We simply can't let waiting for the right experiment to come along to influence what we do next, because we all know there's no perfect experiment. I was at a marketing presentation at South by Southwest a few years ago, and Chief Marketing Officer of what was then the Produce Marketing Association, today the IFPA, was talking about marketing. And she was talking about circles of influence. And it got me to thinking in the audience, relating everything to myself, being selfish, and thinking about produce safety, that we have the same issues going on in produce. And I wrote an article about it and just took this diagram off it for this presentation. But we have to change the conversation across the broadest spectrum you can think of of the industry. So if I'm looking at this from the perspective of a researcher, I've got a lot of audiences I've got to be able to talk to. And you don't think about it sometimes, but of course you've got your own peers and you're very good about that. You do that. But there's a financial insurance community. The last few years when I was in the industry and in my whole tenure at PMA, every year I spent more time, more and more time with financial people, insurance people, because what they do in insuring crops and financing crops and helping companies out and whether to make decisions on to back a company or not comes down to, are they going to be able to sell their product? And if they have a food safety issue and their ability to sell that product is limited, then that it, it severely, severely impacts their viability as a company. And so every year I get more and more calls, especially around outbreaks and what people were saying they were going to do to prevent it from happening. Does that really make any sense? Is it going to have a significant impact? Because many of these companies now are publicly traded. And their stock prices mean a lot to the people in the finance area. Certainly being able to talk to people in the industry, their suppliers, regulators, customers, consumers, all of these are audiences. And there's probably more. I don't mean that this to be everybody you got to talk to, but it's really important. If you can, and you can change it yourself around. If you're an industry person and you've got audiences you have to talk about, just take the industry out and put in the research community. So you can see all of the different circles of influence that you need to touch. And you'd be able to have to sometimes change your language and change your approach to make sure they understand what needs to be done. If an industry person has a problem and yet they're not communicating that with the people who can do the research in a way that helps them understand what the actual objective is and then make available to them access 
to the, to the ground and the authentic materials that are necessary to do that kind of research, then it's going to be a long time before you're going to have everything wrapped up into something that is so obvious that you got to follow it. But the same token, if a researcher designs an experiment and does great work, it's just a publication unless people understand how to use it and how to improve upon it and bring that down almost in a product development sort of way to the field level so that they can actually make it as a usable quote unquote product that can help them improve the safety of their products. Certainly the knowledge base that we've developed over the years though has grown and you see more and more cooperation between researchers and people in the industry. I know this happens in a lot of different venues by a lot of different folks that are funding research, but it's most apparent to me with what I'm most familiar with, which is the Center for Produce Safety. And today, when you apply for, for grants and stuff to the Center for Produce Safety, oftentimes it, one of the things that really has improved over time is that you see the partnership spelled out. They're going to be looking at a certain question, a certain problem that's been raised in the industry, and they've got three or four industry partners to help them not only have access, but then to bounce ideas off so they can share their combined experience to make sure that the research is done with the most meaning to the industry. It wasn't that long ago, 12, 14, 15 years ago, I can clearly remember the 2006 outbreak with spinach that really set the community back and for produce, not having the information, not having the science. And it was out there by itself, but nobody knew about it. And a lot of it hadn't been done at all, hadn't even been a challenge and it had really was not in a way that it could be used by the industry successfully. And that's certainly not everything. I don't mean that sound like it's exclusive, but it really was difficult. But I can tell you from experience, sitting in Salinas, being a scientist myself, finding the information I needed was a very difficult thing to do. And we find ourselves now 15, 16 years later in a much different situation where you have this knowledge base that's come out of various funding agencies. We can bring with that our own awarenesses, uh, our own experiences, contextual data that we've developed within our own companies. And with that together, bring the value that helps guide our own risk and hazard analysis, help us to produce food safety plans and enhance our own produce safety cultures. I think it's important also, as we said before, you think of these complex supply chain diagrams, supply web diagrams that Ed showed us a while ago, much more simplified version. But the things you start here, every place where something is touched or changes is a place where we need to be looking to determine whether there's a hazard, whether there's a risk of contamination that we need to be measuring. And it's not just at the farm. It's as we move forward from that into cooling and distribution, into the processing plants, off into the distribution centers and the stores themselves, the restaurants themselves, right up to the consumer's kitchen, where we have points where food can become contaminated and cause issues. And with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Laurel Dunn to talk a little bit about some of the work she's begun to look down the supply chain. So Laurel, I'll turn it to you. That's Bob. So we have done a bit of work looking at some food safety hazards in distribution centers and particularly ones that handle fresh produce. And one thing we figured out over the past few years of doing this work is that a lot of people aren't even really aware of what a distribution center is or what its function is. So if I go to the grocery store after work and I need to pick up lettuce, meat, and cheese, there's a really good likelihood that all three of those products would have come in on the same truck together, depending on how that company manages their food. Now, so where did that truck come from? The truck didn't stop by the packing house and get the produce and it didn't stop by the dairy and get the cheese and it, it didn't stop at, at every place. All of those foods were collected and consolidated within a distribution center. And so this is just a warehouse that, that compiles different food products for, for retail, for grocery, for wholesale. So that way they can be efficiently loaded. So compiled here and then loaded onto a truck and just make one trip to, to Publix or Kroger or Wegmans or whatever your grocery store is. Otherwise, you would be having hundreds and thousands of trucks coming to these grocery stores and, and dropping food off or to these restaurants and, and bring it. This is really a bottleneck in the supply chain where we have a lot of different food types stored and transported and transiting through these facilities. One of the concerns we have with them is our products like our cheese and our meat and our potato chips. These all come fully sealed. So there really are food safety hazards here as long as they're refrigerated properly at the distribution center. Our issue with produce is because we still have metabolic activity going on after harvest. Our produce is typically shipped 
unsealed. So I think when you go to the grocery store and you buy those blueberries, they're in that clamshell that has little slits in it. Or if you're buying lettuce, it'll be loosely wrapped in plastic. And the industry really began to realize that we don't know what the environmental quality is of these facilities. And just to describe these a little bit, we have a diagram here, which really is pretty representative of a lot of distribution centers. So you can have your administrative, your entrance area, where a lot of your office staff are. And then you get in the facility, you have some big areas with storage at different temperatures. And again, your cold and cool storage will have produce sections, but within that, it might have meat and other chilled product sections. So you have a lot of a lot of material stored and transiting through the same area. And I really want you to pay attention to those receiving and loading dock or shipping dock areas because you, this is where your trucks are pulling up. And so your trucks are pulling up to either dump product off that they've picked up from the dairy or from the packing house. And then it's also where those trucks are being loaded up to then with multiple products to then go to the grocery store or to go to the restaurant or wherever their final destination is. So what we did is we looked at just the environmental conditions of 18 distribution centers because we weren't really sure what microbial hazards uh, might be present. And really, if these, could, these hazards could cause issues with our unsealed fresh produce. Again, we weren't worried about that other food so much, but since the produce goes in and isn't fully sealed going through, we had concerns and just wanted an idea of what hazards are present, where are they, where are they in these facilities, and then what considerations need to be made for a company managing a distribution center within their food safety plan and just for some of their hazard mitigation and risk reduction. So within these 18 centers, we collected approximately 1,000 samples and we we're looking for listeria species. So we're using this as our index for pathogenic listeria monocytogenes. We also collected some ear samples throughout the facility. And the idea with this is if we found listeria species on the floor or, or on the ground, that might not pose much of a risk, but if we found it floating around in the air, we might be more concerned with the pathogen potentially um, contacting again that, that vented produce. So next slide, please. So what we found overall throughout all of these centers is we found about 5% or roughly 50 of our samples were positive for listeria species. So again, not the pathogen, but instead our, our index. We also didn't find air samples that were positive. Which just was good news. It, it meant that what we didn't find it floating around in the air. That doesn't mean it's not. And what we also found was that this listeria and this, this 5% of samples that were positive ended up coming out of 12 of the 18 distribution centers. I, we have this chart that just shows the total number of samples we collected from each one. One thing I want to point out, if you go down to distribution center, we have a 33% positivity rate. And one of the things we discuss a lot with listeria is a lot of times we see contamination popping up when major renovations and things like that are going on. We sampled facility G when we did because they had major renovations that they had just completed. So that was one of the interesting things when you're going facility by facility. Maybe that had nothing to do with it, but we like to point that out with our data. When you see an increased prevalence there, trying to explain why it, it might be there. As far as our general locations within our distribution centers, I pointed out, pay attention to where the shipping and the receiving docks are. We did find a higher prevalence at those docks where those trucks are coming in and then where our forklifts are, are unloading and loading product from the, truck, from the truck. So on our shipping docks, we had about 13% of our samples that were positive came from those docks. What's also interesting about those loading docks when we were at the dock, a lot of times we'd hop on a trailer if there was one at the dock and try to collect some swabs in there. Out of our trailer swabs, which we collected about 80, we had about a 7.6% prevalence rate, which kind of brings that chicken and the egg question in of, are we getting listeria brought into the distribution centers from trucks that aren't being cleaned and sanitized properly? Or are the trucks getting the listeria species from the distribution centers? There is they're being unloaded. You have people walking on the trucks. You have forklifts going on the trucks. So really, where is that contamination coming in? And do we need to be spending more time focusing on sanitation of trucks that are, are hauling, particularly 
our unsealed produce. As you would expect too, throughout the facilities, we tended to find our listeria most frequently on our floors, our floor cracks, expansion joints, places that other similar studies tend to find listeria. So we weren't typically surprised on where it was, but we were a little surprised on just where throughout the facility it was, even though we typically found on floors within those areas. Next slide, please. So just what we get from this is overall, the prevalence of listeria tended to be pretty low within these centers, but we can't necessarily say that there's no risk or that it's low risk yet because we don't really know yet. Again, like I mentioned, we didn't find it in air, but that was just what the methods we were using. So maybe we need to spend some more time and see if we're likely to get transmission or stirring up of dust as we're getting equipment moving. And also maybe we need to be focusing on more targeted cleaning and sanitation procedures in the areas that we tended to have more prevalence. So I will give it back to you, Bob. Thanks a lot, Laurel, and a great, great set of work. I was impressed when I first heard you present this, and certainly it's something that is usable by the industry straight out. And it certainly confirmed a lot of things that were often believed and also opened some people's eyes and created awareness to improve their sanitation efforts and their tracking efforts within the facilities. I think I've already mentioned, and because we're getting close on time here, I'm going to breeze through this really quickly. It's just, it's important that we all understand it. I think we all know this, that most of the research and surveillance work has been done at the production level. And if enough samples are taken, we find things. But I think we also forget sometimes just how advanced some of the, the buying side of the industry is and the produce safety programs that retailers and food service companies have in place, their internal programs for their own facilities and what they do, and also the work that they do with their suppliers. And I think sometimes we I look back on the production side and say, well, they're always asking us to do this, forgetting that the very people that are talking to us about food safety also have a very complex efforts going on themselves to manage food safety. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Strew from Wegmans, and he's going to share a little bit about what Wegmans, certainly an industry leader in food safety from many years ago on forward to today, is doing and some of the thoughts that they have regarding produce safety. So Steve, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Bob. I know we're getting tight on time. I might get through this a little quick just so we have a little time at the end, but quick review. I broke it into three or four buckets. What Wegmans is concerned with as far as produce food safety by no means covers everything we're looking at, but quick way to get through a few of the highlights, if nothing else. Our opportunities, obviously we value our grower supplier relationships. As a retailer, we're very dependent on those suppliers to be doing everything we ask of them on the food safety side. We're trying to partner with the best any chance we get. We try to validate what we're seeing through audits and visits, try to get those first party visits in when we can see after we get their audits to make sure what we see on the audit is what we're seeing when we arrive at their facilities. We have a very strong food safety quality assurance team that helps us with sourcing requirements and audit review, understanding that it's audits are a starting point for us with a supplier, but it's takes a lot of time and effort to be able to track all and our team is growing quite frankly by the week almost to help handle all the food safety load that we currently have and we kind of approach this all with a spirit of continuous improvement we'll review an audit if there's issues we'll reach out to folks we're asking that they're making those changes showing us they're doing the corrective actions as well as verifying them with our visits to make sure folks are always trying to get a little better we want those proactive suppliers, as Bob mentions, not the checklist suppliers. So we're willing to make sure that's where we're going. We kind of have a trust but verify way of doing things. Believe a lot in the boots on the ground approach. We try to get out to the suppliers, not only the food safety and quality team, but even our merchants and buyers that are dealing with these folks are pretty well trained and versed in food safety. So when they're out looking at new suppliers, they have that on their mind, not just what can you grow and what kind of price you can give me, but they understand the importance of food safety when they're out there as well. For the last couple of years, especially with the onset of COVID, we've had to rely a little more on the use of third-party assessors. Obviously, travel was tough. We found some regional folks that could help us look at some of our suppliers on a fairly consistent basis, and that's helped us on our end. 
And then we believe a lot in grower education. We have a very strong education program, especially for our local grower community that we've hang our hat on. And we brought a lot of our small local growers a long way as far as their understanding of food safety and in their processes on their farm. So we take a lot of pride in that. We tend to focus on higher risk and problem commodities. We have our own Wegmans leafy green specification. After the two Thanksgiving outbreaks in 2018 and 2019, we were challenged by our CEO to come up with something that would make us as safe as we possibly thought we could for our customers. Our CEO basically stated, if we can make it safe, I don't care if we have, I hate to pick on one commodity, but he didn't care if we had romaine lettuce in our stores or not, if we couldn't guarantee it was safe for our customers. So we put that in place, hopefully raise the bar a little bit with those specifications and hopefully the result, and it has resulted in what we feel is a little safer commodity out there for us. Obviously, sometimes we get some commodities that surprise us, things like peaches and onions that have popped up over the last couple of years. But even when those outbreaks have touched us, we again approach those suppliers with that spirit of continuous improvement, try to work with them where we can. Hopefully, we can continue that business relationship if they show us they can make the changes that we feel will make that a safer product for us. And then Wegmans always been strong in industry involvement, Center for Produce Safety, Leafy Green Safety Coalition, FMI, all, all the big produce groups. Wegmans has always had a strong presence there, and we encourage our suppliers to try to be part of those groups as well. Next slide. Obviously, we always have food safety programs in our stores that we're working on, trying to improve all the time. Had some in-store challenges, obviously, with COVID. Even start, we'll consider a pretty decent retailer. We've had the staffing concerns and turnover that everyone else in the industry has had. When you think of those folks turning over, that's constantly a need for more food safety training and education. You educate those folks, they leave. You got to get that next batch educated. So that's been a real test for us to make sure that's happening. And continuing, Bob spoke to food safety culture. I like to think Wegmans has a pretty strong food safety culture. I can guarantee it starts from the top down and everybody believes in that, but there's room for continuous improvement as well. We found during COVID with all the folks being short staffed, simple things like just taking temperature, temperatures in our freestanding refrigerated cases. If you haven't been in a Wegmans, a lot of prepared foods, a lot of freestanding cases, and it took a lot of time and effort on the day, just to get around and take care of all those temperatures. So now we're leveraging our technology a little more, doing some temperature monitoring where we no longer have to send a person around to do that. It's all being done by a program, just getting that up and going, but an amazing amount of time saving that has resulted in for us. In store, we have divisional and corporate auditors focusing actually more on education as they have on audits, especially during COVID with this turnover and staffing, they couldn't be quite focused on what the score was. They had to spend more of their time focusing on these new employees, teaching them as they went and learn as they go, which we felt was more important than, did you get a 93 or a 95? Let's keep teach these people the right way and what they ought to be focusing on. So that's been our focus throughout COVID. And then there's daily, monthly food safety audits. That's something that's always gone on, ranking by store. Just a little extra incentive to make sure you're doing what we're supposed to do at store level. Next, please. We have some internal operations here at Wegmans, things that kind of make us Wegmans. Obviously, we're always trying to partner with the best, tracking, finding, and training. Our key food safety personnel is always a struggle, but we're constantly on the lookout for those folks. Reacting to FISMA, preventive patrols, SQF auto compliance, a lot of that is some of these facilities, and as well as applying the produce safety rule, USD harmonized gaps, plus things like that for our folks at our own organic farm. Obviously, we're trying to share sourcing requirements for our growers at all times. They all have a supplier code of practice that they have to adhere to. We have production facilities that produce is used in, so those are all SQF audited facilities, making sure those are meeting all our food safety requirements as produce enters and is used in facilities. Our SQA team is focused on compliance, food safety trainings for the team. We give them all the trainings they need, just that continuous improvement 
So these young folks that we're bringing on our team are getting that training and can take the next step in our company to be strong food safety advocates. Wegmans grower trainings is something that we've done for years. My predecessor, Bill Poole, got those up and going for him. For us, I've tried to carry those on. I think that's made a big difference in our local uh, grower population on understanding not only the big basics of gaps when we first started, but we've brought in more recent and current topics, trying to keep them up to date on the latest things. Things like, oh, we had a cyclosporin talk this past time. We talked about traceability and the sanitary design. We had a whole workshop on sanitary design. Just trying to move them up the ladder to make them a little better. Think about a few more things. Realize that it isn't just on the West Coast where there are issues. They can have the same issues right on their farm here in the middle of New York State. And you got to plan ahead, work ahead, get an action plan so you're not on the short end of things here. You're doing everything you can to be a better and safer grower for us. And that's why we want to partner with you. You're showing us that willingness and ability to grow and get better. Next slide. And just our distribution facility, I just threw that in because it's another place we have to keep an eye on things. Obviously, it's important temperature monitoring. We're doing that with temp tails, making sure we're keeping product cold throughout the cold chain. There is a FISMA requirement on ice produce that we've been struggling with, but we think we found a solution using vinyl sheets that we're going to put between pallets to help prevent water from dripping from one pallet to the other. Our warehouses are not big enough to put all our ice produce on one level. So we have come up with a system with vinyl sheets that we are using. We're actually swabbing them to make sure that we're not creating another issue with that. But we did do a purge test just to see what kind of water would come off, say, a pallet of broccoli. And in three days, almost 20 gallons of water would come off a single pallet, and that would be working its way down below anything below. So we felt it was something we had to work towards and make come up with a solution, and we have. Obviously, we comply with Sanitary Transportation Act, making sure our trailers are clean and anything deliveries coming in. We have a strong quality assurance team of QA inspectors always ensuring product quality for us. And then we are currently very busy with solutions to support FISMA and uh, the new 204 traceability rule. So I'll wrap it up there, Bob, so we can continue here. Thanks very much, Steve. And again, I can't thank you enough over the years for all the leadership Wegmans has provided. And I'm a particularly big fan of your grower training programs as I participated in some of those. And you could just see the people paying attention and you build that culture outside of Wegmans to your suppliers over time through that. And I think that's really important. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip through these next slides that really deal with using the information we have and the technologies we have to improve our food safety cultures and improve our supply chain performance in terms of food safety. And I really just get to the end of the day because I think that's something that we often lose track of as we get busy in our day-to-day -day operations, we forget at the end of the day, produce safety is always personal. When we have these outbreaks, we can talk about the financial implications. We can talk about the business interruptions. We can talk about the people issues within the industry and, and the upset that causes. But at the end of the day, it's about the people that consume our products. And if we want them to continue to consume our products, we have to understand that it is personal to them. They buy our products because they are eating them because they are nutritious and they're good for them. And they understand that they've been brought up to believe that. And yet when we, if we have an outbreak where people get ill, it's something that's, it's quite concerning. And I know that when I was in the industry, 2006, and that spinach outbreak was a cornerstone moment for me. It wasn't the first time I'd been involved with something with an outbreak related to produce or even a product that my company was producing. But it was the one that really caught my heart because there was a little boy that was three years old and was fed spinach and he passed away. And let's face it, it is the old and the young that are most vulnerable. And I've clearly entered into the old phase of things. So I'm probably a little selfish there, but also the young, as you can see my grandchildren here. It's something that is personal and something we have to bear in mind. So when we make those difficult decisions to invest more resources in something or to add that new person that's trained or to not use a particular lot or ship a particular lot. We have to bear in mind that everything we do has a consequence. This is serious stuff. And 
I thank all of our presenters today for sharing their perspectives. I hope you found it interesting. I apologize that it went long and I'm going to turn it back over to Laura, who promises me we will answer your questions. If not already been done, we'll do that in writing as a follow-up. And I'll turn it back to Laura Strawn right now for her final comments. Laura? Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Bob. First, I just want to thank the speakers for their time today, Bob, the panel. Thank you all for making season one a blast. Personally, I really enjoyed getting to work with our different experts. And as Bob mentioned, we will answer any of your questions. So all of those of you that submitted, we will go through those and we will also take a stab at summarizing this on a very high level and maybe even including a few other questions that we had that were burning as well. So with that, I will let everyone please go have a wonderful summer. Thank you so much. Take care.